So uh, when we were discussing what to do, John and I and, and Brian, uh, we thought that uh, on those Sundays when I get to, to teach, that I'd uh, take you guys through a book. And uh, I decided to start us off uh, in Galatians. Um, <clears throat> Lord, thank you for this beautiful day. Uh, thank you that it's uh, Palm Sunday and we get to uh, remember the beginning of uh, that wonderful week where you atoned for our sins. And Lord, thank you for uh, this wonderful group of people. We ask that they would be blessed by the hearing of your word and that uh, your spirit would fall upon this place and edify us uh, in the teaching of your word today. We ask these things in your name. Amen. And teaching an entire book is a real challenge uh, because <laughs> there's so much detail uh, and so much wonderful truth in the detail uh, that it can be easy to just get bogged down in the detail. And then there's so much truth in the, in the wide angle of things. It's, uh, it's almost like you're in a forest. See that first picture? It's almost like you're in a forest golly, I didn't even start with the reading. We should, we should probably read first. It's been that kind of day. Our text this morning, our text this morning is uh, the book of Galatians. We're going to be looking at the first five verses. Let's read them together. Uh, Galatians chapter one, beginning in verse one. Paul, an apostle, not sent from men nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. Amen. So today, uh, I'm hoping to introduce us to the book of Galatians. And on those Sundays when, uh, when I'm privileged to uh, open the word with you, uh, I'll be walking through Galatians with you. Um, and then uh, once we're done with Galatians, I guess we'll just march right on into Ephesians, <laughs> Philippians, Colossians. Just keep turning that page right until we get to the end of the book, teach through the concordance, and then right back to the beginning. Uh, <laughs> but it's a real difficulty. It's a challenge uh, when you're getting ready to teach through a book because there's so much beauty and truth in the details, and there's so much beauty and truth in the, in the unified picture. Uh, I've heard it said that uh, the challenge is, do you preach the forest, or do you preach the trees, or do you preach the leaves? Uh, there's wonderful truths at all of those levels of Scripture, and the macro view of, of uh, the whole Bible working together to bring God's uh, unified message to us, and at the individual book level, how each book interacts as part of that whole, and then at the individual word level even, there's so much meaning and truth packed into those words. And so today, uh, I'd like to start at the forest, then we'll move to the tree, and then we'll talk about the leaves that we just read, those five verses. Um, this picture might look like a, a pretty forest, but it's actually something quite remarkable, and I thought it was somewhat applicable uh, to, the, to the content of today's message. What you're looking at is the Pando Quivering Aspen tree in Utah. Uh, according to the internet, this is the largest single living organism on the planet. It covers 100 acres. All of those trees are genetically identical. They share a root system, uh, and scientists speculate that that might be the oldest living organism around. And much like how that tree or that forest is actually one unified organism working together, uh, so also uh, are the scriptures. You, you have many different components, but they're all one unified whole working together to give us God's truth. Um, and much like how in this forest we can appreciate the the individual leaves uh, and the beautiful detail there and uh, the individual trees and the wonderful uh, beauty in that. 
uh, and then the whole forest, uh, the scriptures work in much the same way. Um, so my intent today, like I said, we'll start with the forest. We're going to uh, sort of examine uh, how Galatians fits into the, the forest of the scriptures. And then we'll uh, look at Galatians in particular, get sort of our, our heads wrapped around that and, and look at the, uh, the particulars of those five verses. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was privileged to share on Thursday nights about the Bible and what it is and, and how it's arranged and all of that. And we covered how it's uh, one unified whole that's divided into two Testaments, Old and New. And within the New Testament, we have uh, 27 smaller books. Um, and of those 27 smaller books, 21 are epistles. That is, they're letters. Uh, and additionally, you've got epistles in the first couple of chapters of Revelation and a couple of epistles uh, jotted down in the book of Acts, too. So this is a pervasive uh, way of writing uh, in the New Testament uh, and expressing God's truth. Uh, epistle is simply a Bible talk for letter uh, in, in very, very basic terms. But we can't. Uh, we got to be careful not to diminish the significance of these letters. This isn't like the letters that I write to my buddy Matt out in Virginia, where it's, oh, hi, how's the weather? How are your chickens? No, these are uh, very particular letters inspired by God. And this is how he chose to give us his truth. He chose not to write us term papers or big systematic theology books or, or anything like that. He chose to, uh, to communicate his truth to us in a way that engages our hearts and our minds. Uh, we must recognize, first of all, that these letters are uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it's a particular form of communication. Um, these letters were written to a particular audience, by a particular person, at a particular time, for a particular reason. And as we uh, come to them, we have to sort of wrap our heads around that. Uh, so uh, the epistles of the New Testament, they follow a particular pattern as well, um, in keeping with sort of first century letter writing. They're generally organized into a four-part structure. Uh, typically, you'll see an introduction where the author identifies himself, he identifies his audience, and then you'll see uh, usually a prayer of thanksgiving or a blessing upon the, the audience. Then the author moves into the body of his message, and then he concludes with a farewell and often a benediction. So you've got this four-part structure in most of your epistles. I say most. Remember that. Uh, <laughs> um, now, though this next part might not be spiritually edifying, uh, and I don't want to get too bogged down in the weeds here, I would like to go kind of by the numbers uh, a little bit um, and uh, sort of uh, paint the picture a little bit more clearly. Somewhere around 40% by volume of the New Testament is uh, the writing of epistles. 21 of the 27 books, like we said, our epistles. Additionally, you've got two in Acts and uh, seven recorded to the churches in Revelation. So this type of uh, communication is pervasive. Of those uh, 21, 13 are authored by Paul. So we're narrowing down a little bit. Uh, people typically divide the epistles into the Pauline category and the general category. The general category is often called the Catholic epistles. So you've got James, Hebrews, First and Second Peter, First and Third John, Jude. Those are all the Catholic epistles. Of the Pauline epistles, we can further divide them into those addressed to the church, and those addressed to particular people. Um, some people further divide them still into the, the prison epistles and those written outside of prison. Um, but it's interesting to note that nine of those 13 are written to churches. Uh, and uh, of those nine, there's a couple of uh, churches that got two letters. And so you've got uh, seven churches particularly addressed in the New Testament. Forgive the map, it's the best I could do. Uh, so to sort of uh, acquaint ourselves with uh, where we're at geographically, the dark area is uh, ocean, sea, the light area is land. And so in the order that they appear in your Bible, uh, you've got the epistle to the Romans right up there. Uh, you've got the epistle to the Corinthians that's a very important strait. It was a shipping channel uh, from points east to points west. Uh, then you've got Galatians, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And note that Galatians is written to a region, a district, more than it is a particular place. Uh, as far as we can tell, 
Galatians is the only such letter uh, like that in the New Testament where it's written um, to a, a, a dispersed area as opposed to a particular church. Um, there's a little bit of debate among eggheads if Ephesians isn't like that as well, but uh, that's another talk for another time. And you've got Ephesians down here approximately. Uh, and you've got Philippians up there next to Thessalonica. You've got Colossians down there uh, on that west coast of Asia Minor. And then you've got First and Second Thessalonians written to the church in Thessalonica way up there. So when you uh, pair that with uh, Hebrews, which was written to the Jews, uh, and then James, First and Second Peter were written to a general audience, you can see that uh, by the time the New Testament canon was closed, it covered pretty much the whole known world, at least the, the major population center for those people at that time. Uh, so not only did it cover all of God's truth uh, doctrinally within the text of the message, but it also covered uh, the, the geography of it as well. I thought that was uh, interesting to note. Uh, these letters were written at a unique time. We're talking about uh, the first generation of believers. There were still many people uh, within the church uh, who had seen the ministry of the Lord Jesus, who were there. Um, we're talking about people who were uh, starting the faith uh, under immense persecution. Uh, and already, as these epistles are being written, uh, challenges are being uh, made to the doctrines being presented. Um, many of these epistles are written specifically to counter various uh, false teachings and heresies that were already beginning to crop up before the scriptures could even be penned down. Um, so we're talking about, uh, as we're talking about the, the rest of the text of the New Testament from, from Acts to Revelation, uh, circa AD 49 to AD 90 or so, about a 40 year span there where the church is growing, expanding, setting its roots down uh, and uh, getting established. Uh, Worth noting, uh, generally speaking, uh, because of some internal evidence and whatnot, uh, Galatians and First and Second Thessalonians are generally considered to be among the first epistles put to paper. Um, they were some of the first, uh, as far as we can tell, or as near as we can gather. You know, uh, Paul wasn't very good about putting dates in the top right corner, so uh, <laughs> we're left to sort of put puzzle pieces together on that one. If you read all these epistles back to back, you'll find pervasive themes throughout, especially when you get into Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. You can almost chart them out. And, you know, if you were to take each verse individually, you could, you could match them up and see that there's a whole lot of overlap in a lot of these uh, epistles and texts. Um, you'll find many of the same doctrines ad addressed again and again. Um, let's see. Some of this is because you have a dispersed audience. Uh, you know, it would, it would take some time for epistle from uh, the Galatians to reach the Romans and vice versa. So in order to, to get the truth out there, uh, there is a practical element to it. Uh, but some of it also, much like how we have the Gospels presented to us at four different perspectives, uh, these truths being presented to us in the epistles in these different ways help us to sort of uh, wrap our minds around it. And the repetition also uh, lets us know that this is important. When somebody says it again and again, you know it's probably time to perk up and uh, and take note. So when you see that we're saved by grace alone through all these epistles, man, that's something to pay attention to. <laughs> so uh, let's see. Uh, writing this way allows many doctrines to be explained as well as issues to be addressed. Uh, for example, the Corinthian church had major issues with fleshy and sinful behavior among its members. The Colossian church had issues with outsiders coming in and tainting the gospel with this uh, sort of hippie psychobabble thing called Gnosticism, where it was this uber spiritual mystic uh, sort of thing. And so uh, when you read Colossians, you'll see a lot of uh, pushback against that. The churches in Galatia had problems with a uh, particular sect of, of heretics coming in and saying that you have to have faith plus works. They were teaching this Judaizing kind of gospel that was really sort of uh, damaging to the whole thing. Uh, all of these, interestingly, uh, although they might have taken different shapes and different forms, uh, remain issues uh, in our hearts and in our lives uh, and in public today. Um, so even though these were uh, particular issues to those particular people at those particular times, the truths expressed uh, remain true to us today. Uh, 
So the epistles present uh, the fundamental truths from the faith from different angles so that we can more fully grasp them. Why does all of this matter? A couple of reasons. And then we'll move on to Galatians proper. First, understanding these things uh, can help us uh, get our head wrapped around the grand narrative of the Bible. You know, the Bible is not a bunch of independent books all mishmashed together. They're telling one unique story. They're drawing us to uh, recognize uh, the glory and power of God, to see uh, his perfect salvation plan for us, and then to lead us uh, into an appropriate faith walk with him. Uh, the, the scriptures are, are explaining all of this to us. And so getting that wide angle picture helps us to understand that this is all one grand unified uh, message. Galatians, uh, for example, though it has a different tone and emphasis from Ephesians, teaches the same doctrine and preaches the same gospel. Second, it gives us uh, the correct interpretive lens uh, to study the scriptures by. Um, very often you'll hear people as they're uh, studying the scriptures, they'll pick up the Bible, they'll read a verse, and they'll say, well, to me this means mm -hmm. that should set off red flags. That should set off huge red flags. Uh, the scriptures are not open to that type of interpretation. Uh, the Holy Spirit knew what he was doing when he inspired these people to write. He had a particular message to communicate, and uh, it is incumbent upon us to do our best to grasp that message as he intended. And uh, one of the best ways to do that is to understand what the author was trying to communicate and how the first generation of readers would have understood it. And uh, you begin your interpretive process through that lens. What is the author trying to say? What was the original audience going to receive it as? You know, um, there's many examples that we could give, but author's intent, original audience's understanding is uh, key to understanding the texts uh, in the scriptures. Lastly, it has some apologetic value. Um, you know, we don't follow craftily devised tales. Uh, these are real people, real events that actually happened. Uh, and so understanding the realities of how all of this came together and how uh, the challenges that these churches were going through and uh, the way that the Holy Spirit chose to address them uh, helps us to be uh, more readily equipped uh, to defend our faith. Uh, we should uh, never lose sight of the fact that this is a real book that actually happened. Really. Uh, <laughs> um, after the service, uh, if you like, uh, in my notes, I've got uh, sort of a breakdown, a chart. Uh, I tried to put it in the in the slides, but it didn't work of uh, of Paul's church epistles, uh, their time of writing, their, their general themes and things like that. So if you'd like, I can crack open the book uh, and, and show you some of that. Um, but now, let's move on to Galatians, uh, overview and theme of the book. When beginning an examination uh, of a book, uh, just like anything, it's important to ask your, your five W's, right? Who, what, when, where, why, and how. Uh, generally, you'll see people establish who wrote it, who the intended audience was, when they wrote it, why they wrote it, uh, and so on. So uh, now uh, I'd like to, before we get into our verses, Establish author, audience, time, and occasion. And then uh, the general theme of the book. The authorship, don't know if you noticed, it's right there in verse one, Paul. Uh, there's uh, little debate, uh, little way to misunderstand uh, that Paul, the, the same Paul who's uh, referenced so much in the book of Acts, is uh, one and the same as the author of this book. Uh, there's no real serious argument or debate over that, uh, there's plenty of internal evidence in terms of his style of writing, how it matches with all of his other books. Uh, within the narrative of the gospel, or within the narrative of Acts, you see uh, Paul interacting with the Galatian churches on his first and second missionary journey. So he had a, an established relationship with these people. And all of these things come together, plus the fact that he names himself, uh, to give us a pretty uh, clear and decisive answer as to who wrote it. Um, now, obviously, Paul was the hand that moved the pen, but we recognize that it was the Holy Spirit working in Paul, giving him the words uh, for the church in Galatia and by extension for us uh, today. So Paul, as a tool of the Holy Spirit, wrote the book. Now, the audience portion, this, uh, this one was a little bit tricky. Um, the commentaries are a little bit disagreed on this because, as you see, Galatia is a region but it's also an ethnicity. Uh, several centuries before um, the writing here, 
um, there was a, a Celtic Gaulish group from the Germany region that had come down and invaded uh, that area and settled, much like the Philistines did in southern Israel and sort of made it their own. And they were known as Galatians. Uh, and so that region, uh, in addition to being a geographic region, uh, the title Galatian also refers to a certain ethnic people. And uh, different people have different understandings of that. Uh, some people say that Paul was writing to the geographic region in certain cities there. Some people say he was writing to that ethnic group that uh, had occupied that whole northern Turkey uh, area. So those two theories are present. Uh, Personally, uh, I'm inclined to think that uh, Paul was writing to the geographic region, to those particular cities that he uh, had visited on his first missionary journey, these people that he had an established relationship with. Um, but I have to acknowledge that smart people uh, disagree with me on this and that there's uh, good arguments uh, on both sides. My personal opinion, the better arguments fall on Paul's uh, writing to the people that he knew. Um, but it's a matter that we can have uh, a bit of uh, uh, respectful disagreement on. Um, and the truth remains, no matter which view you take, it's to the churches at Galatia. So the, the, the truth that we can draw there from is that this is written to believers, regardless of whether we're talking about people in a certain geographic area or a certain ethnic group. Uh, these are believers that we're talking about. Um, so it's not evangelistic as much as it is uh, expository in that way. So um, it's, it, to, to address the, the letter to the churches at Galatia, uh, I think would be something like uh, if the Apostle Paul were to write a letter to us and address it to the churches of Lassen County. Um, you know, it's a, it's a wide area with, uh, with a diverse uh, group of people, uh, but we're all, you know, sort of in that, in that group. Um, as we mentioned before, Galatians uh, is considered by many to be one of the earliest books written to the churches. Uh, estimates range from A.D. 49 to 55, um, and those estimates are sort of tied to which uh, theory you follow as to whether or not he's writing to a geographic region or to an ethnic people. Um, personally, uh, as we get into the book, uh, we'll see that a lot of what he's dealing with, with this whole uh, Judaizers issue and should we be circumcised and follow feast days and things, um, these issues were addressed pointedly uh, by the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. The, the apostles got together and they addressed this issue. They wrote an epistle in Acts 15 uh, specifically addressing, do Gentiles need to be circumcised to be uh, members of the faith? Uh, and it's notable that uh, Paul doesn't make any mention of that here. And so when we come to dating it, uh, that's one compelling reason why people tend to place it early, because that event happened before his second missionary journey. So we're talking about relatively early uh, in the ministry of Paul. Um, some people place it later and would uh, suggest that the book of Galatians was meant to be a supplement to that brief epistle uh, in Acts. Uh, regardless, uh, it would seem that this was still a, a, a fairly early letter uh, in, the, in the life of the church. Uh, personally, I find myself uh, leaning towards the it was written before the second missionary journey, before the Acts Council uh, theory. It seems like with the arguments that Paul lays out in the book against Judaizers, uh, that he almost certainly would have referenced that, especially considering how much of the book is his testimony. Um, so uh, we have a, a fairly early date of writing. Uh, and it would be a little bit less likely, in my opinion, that... Uh, it would have happened later. Um, but either way, you're talking about AD 49 to 55, uh, plus or minus 20 years after the uh, resurrection and ascension of Christ. Um, now, as to themes, this one was fun. Uh, I found myself quite jealous reading commentaries because these commenters, uh, they can sit there with such confidence and say, the theme of Galatians is Christian liberty, period. And... Uh, you read the book and you read it again and you're like, well, yes, Christian liberty is a pervasive element through there. But then you've also got justification by faith. You've got the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You've got how the law is supposed to interact with us in a healthy way and how the law uh, can be a tool used by the flesh to pull us away and uh, what the proper use of the law is. And you've got uh, old covenant, new covenant, and just so many pervasive themes. So 
Uh, it's generally true. If you were to sum it up in one word, Christian liberty is not a bad one. Uh, but there are so many wonderful themes in the book of Galatians. Uh, it's like, how do you pick just one? Uh, <laughs> Among the big themes of the book, uh, like we said, liberty in Christ. We're freed from the bondage of the law. Uh, justification by faith, huge one. Uh, we're going to come back to that uh, at the end. Uh, our position as sons and heirs through Christ, that we're no longer slaves to sin, but that we're sons and heirs through Christ, gets uh, a lot of uh, press in this book. The ministry of the Holy Spirit gets a lot of press in the second half of the book. Uh, Paul also takes the opportunity to uh, share in an extended way um, perhaps nowhere, perhaps here in 2 Corinthians uh, are the two biggest examples, his own personal testimony, because uh, these people who are coming in and preaching this this false gospel um, were challenging Paul's uh, authority as an apostle. So uh, in order to sort of lay the groundwork for his argument, he has to first defend his right to make the argument. And so you get uh, a pretty extent, expansive testimony from Paul as well. Um, so uh, if you're the note-taking kind, uh, you'll find several words uh, springing up uh, repeatedly throughout the book. One of my favorite things about all the letters of Paul is uh, the guy can't finish a sentence without mentioning the Lord Jesus. Uh, it's like every verse, there's the Lord Jesus, there's the Lord Jesus, there's the Lord Jesus, Christ Jesus, Lord Jesus. And so uh, if you look, you will find dozens of references uh, to the Lord Jesus. You'll also find many references to faith. Uh, you'll find faith and the law contrasted quite a lot. Um, you'll find justification. Um, you'll find the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Um, and there's uh, several more, but that will do uh, for now. Like AMPM's old catchphrase, it's just too much good stuff. Um, a lot of people at this point in a study like to pick that one key verse. And again, I think it's a tad arbitrary uh, to try to say the whole content of the book can be summed up in this one verse. Um, especially in a book like Galatians that sort of has several irons in the fire. Um, and so I would invite you guys uh, to sit and think through some of your favorite Galatians memory verses and uh, see if you pick the same one that I picked. But if we were going to do that exercise and pick just one verse to be the theme of the book, uh, my vote would go towards Galatians 2.16. Uh, this is somewhat uh, arbitrary, somewhat subjective, but I think it gives a, a wonderful summary of the general theme of the book. Galatians 2.16, uh, I think I got it on the slides. Yep, there it is. Uh, reads, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, since by the works of the, flaw, of, of the law, no flesh will be justified. This is a uh, pervasive and ongoing theme that we are made right only through the person and work of the Lord Jesus. So um, that's my pick. Uh, when we go into discussion, uh, there's many, many good verses out there. Uh, again, I think it's a little silly to try to say this one verse summarizes the whole book, but it can be a fun discussion starter. Now I see already, <laughs> just going through the book, I was supposed to go forest, tree, leaves, uh, but <laughs> the leaves are so cool. It's hard not to get caught up in the leaves, even when we're supposed to be talking about the tree. So summarizing the book of Galatians like that, uh, we saw author, we saw audience, we saw date of writing, occasion. Um, the occasion for writing, like I said, uh, these Judaizers coming in and preaching a different gospel. Uh, hopefully this wasn't too distracting or confusing. Just remember the key takeaway in summarizing this book, the true gospel is rooted in faith in Christ Jesus, not works of the law. And this truth brings us to a spirit-filled life of liberty as sons of God. So that last sentence, like if I was trying to make one sentence to try to tie the whole book together, that was my best guess at it. So there you go. Now, let's go on to the leaves. Let's actually get into the text of Scripture, shall we? Galatians chapter 1 and verse 1. Uh, Paul, an apostle, not sent from men nor through the agency of man, but through Christ Jesus and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So Paul is wasting no time here. Uh, when you compare Galatians to books like Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians, uh, Galatians has a much more uh, firm and uh, kind of harsh tone to it. Uh, and it, uh, it's, it's pretty choppy. And so right off the bat, you see him uh, already starting to lay some, some uh, ground pieces 
uh, in his argument uh, against these Judaizers. These Judaizers were apparently saying that Paul was just a man, that he was uh, uh, not qualified to be sharing the gospel like that. So right out of the gate, he, uh, he establishes, oh no, my ministry is from God. Uh, the ordination that I received is from God himself. Uh, he takes the title of apostle, and uh, he attributes that uh, apostolic authority not to men, but to God. This will be important later in answering critics of his ministry and the gospel that he preaches. Um, and already, uh, when you look at the first 10 verses, uh, I think the word gospel appears uh, four, five, six times somewhere in there, um, because those first 10 verses of the book, uh, he's contrasting the true gospel and the false gospel. And already uh, he is uh, getting right into the nitty gritty of defining what the gospel is, uh, that God the Father raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Uh, we haven't even finished the first sentence yet, and we've already got uh, the gospel in miniature right there. Um, observe also that two of the three persons of the Trinity are already present. Um, the Spirit uh, takes a little while to make his appearance in this book. It's in the in the later chapters, but when he does, boy, oh boy, what an appearance it is. Uh, the, the epistle to Galatians is a wonderful book uh, for establishing the Trinitarian doctrine that we have. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, these three being one, and these three being God. Um, so Paul is already, even in his greeting and his identification of himself, uh, framing the issue. Uh, people are taking issue with the message and with the messenger, uh, and that these people, uh, notice how he says, not from men or through the agency of man, uh, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, there's this sort of uh, tone to it that uh, the Judaizers are thinking that they're uh, against Paul, and he's uh, already sort of subtly throwing a jab in, you're not against me, you're against God. Uh <laughs> So we uh, receive by way of interpretation that this book is scripture, that this book is uh, written under the authority and influence of God himself uh, right here in this first verse. In verse two, all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Um, so once again, Paul's sort of building his argument that he's not alone in what he's about to say. Um, when we look at scripture, this is an important thing uh, to consider as we come to interpretation and application. Uh, Peter summed it up well when he said, no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Uh, if there's a truth in the Bible, then the Holy Spirit has revealed it to more people than just you. So uh, he's calling in these other brothers who uh, can affirm and uh, sort of countersign with him uh, in the book and say, uh, these brethren who are with me, uh, they agree as well. Um, so even though we recognize that his authority is from God, it's also recognized by other people. Uh, this is further bolstering his argument against these critics who've come in and undercut the work that he did in Galatia and establishing the churches there. So we note that he's not alone writing this. Other faithful men are present, and they endorse what he's saying via the Holy Spirit. Uh, the application here is the Holy Spirit confirms good biblical interpretation by way of a multitude of witnesses. Uh, and again, sort of in establishing the setting, notice that it says churches of Galatia. So we're talking about a uh, fairly wide spread here. Verse three, uh, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a typical uh, greeting of Paul. Uh, we see it in many of the epistles and the order here matters. Uh, grace and peace. Uh, it's a uh, sort of confluence of uh, the Greek uh, um, greeting of grace to you and the Hebrew greeting of peace to you, shalom, and charis, respectively. Um, but the order matters. First, we receive uh, grace given to us by our Lord, and that grace results in a peace that passes all understanding. Uh, so this is part of our inheritance as children of God. Uh, in chapter 4, Paul builds this idea that we are uh, adopted children of God and that that comes with uh, an inheritance. Uh, in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, Paul writes, When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive the adoption of sons. 
Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his sons into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you're no longer a slave, but if a son, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. So part of our inheritance uh, as Christians, we get eternal life. We get the ministry of the Holy Spirit in this life. And uh, part of that ministry is uh, this supernatural peace that, uh, you know, we can uh, rest assured that God's word is true and that uh, we will get to spend eternity with him. Um, this peace is something that is uh, transcendent of our understanding. Uh, one of my favorite verses about the subject is John chapter 14 and verse 27. Mm-hmm. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Uh, within context, uh, the Lord Jesus here is talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to be given to those believers. And one of the things that he's going to do for them is give them that perfect peace that passes uh, understanding. There's a bit of irony here. A uh, little subtle, but it's there. Uh, we have perfect peace through the Spirit uh, in this uh, wonderful rest of understanding God's completed work for us. Um, it's part of our inheritance as adopted sons of God. It's a foundational component of the true gospel message. But the Galatians were setting all that aside for a works-based gospel. Uh, So he's wishing them grace and peace when he's about to wrap them on the knuckles for walking away from the very thing that gives them grace and peace. Uh, So the application here is, if you want the peace of God, rest in the Lord. Uh, Don't go trying to uh, say, the gospel is good, the gift of the Lord is good. I just got to do this too. I just got to receive communion and get baptized. Uh, I've got to get catechized. I've got to gain membership in a church. No, no, it's just the completed work of the Lord. And so uh, there's a a slight little needle in there, I think, uh, to sort of wake the Galatians up, uh, that there is uh, grace and peace in God the Father. And in trying to do it yourself, there's not. That's my read on it. I'm interested to hear your read on it uh, after that. He's reminding them of uh, what they're forsaking even in uh, in this. And it also leads into a benediction. One of the great things about the Apostle Paul, my opinion, is uh, every once in a while, he just gets distracted talking about how good the Lord is and he can't help himself. And sometimes he'll just kind of go off the rails and praise God for a minute. And we have it here too. Uh, In verse 4, the Lord Jesus uh, gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Remember, he's getting ready to uh, lay out uh, a defense of the gospel uh, against those false gospels being preached. And so he again gives us the gospel in miniature, that the Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins and uh, rescues us from this present evil age. Um, that is, uh, in effect, the gospel message in a nutshell. Uh, you know, Romans 10, 9 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. We believe that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, saved us from our sins. The grace and peace message that he just said is the perfect segue into the gospel message. In one quick sentence, Paul perfectly lays out the true gospel. Uh, notice the order and the agency. It is the Lord Jesus giving himself for our sins and the Lord Jesus rescuing us. He is the active member in this whole operation. Um, It's very tempting to sit there and say, in order to be saved, God does all of this, and I've just got to push myself over that line. And uh, Paul is going to be emphatic throughout this book, and in fact, through most of the epistles, that that is not the case. We must rest entirely on the perfect work of our Lord Jesus. And so uh, he concludes uh, this little opening act uh, by saying, to whom be glory forevermore, amen. Uh, And it sort of leads us back to one of the grand themes of the entire Bible, uh, that uh, God is sovereign and God is powerful and God is worthy of the glory. Um, Note the multifunctionality of this verse. It's at once a benediction. It's also a blessing to the brethren and an exposition of the gospel. One of the remarkable things about the scripture is uh, the economy of words. Uh, You know, I mentioned Galatians 2.16. It says we're justified by faith. 
uh, libraries are full of books explaining justified by faith. And God wrote it down just that quick and just that easy. Uh, it is remarkable to me uh, how clear the message can be, uh, especially considering that it took me 4,000 words uh, to get through five verses this morning, uh, that God can do it in just a few words and be so much more edifying than I could ever hope to be. Um, this verse sort of called back to mind uh, one of our favorite things that me and John have been talking about for, for months now. Question number one in the Westminster Catechism. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God, to enjoy him forever. And so we see Paul doing that even here. That is, uh, I think, our eternal uh, purpose and calling is to glorify God, uh, who is worthy of all the praise and glory. So now I'd like to call your memory back uh, to earlier when we said that the, that the epistles are generally arranged in four uh, components. We just breezed through the first one, the introduction portion, uh, and normally we'd be moving on to the second one, the Thanksgiving portion. One of the remarkable things, uh, everybody, everybody that I read mentioned it, uh, is that Galatians is totally absent, the Thanksgiving portion. You look at a verse, at a book like Philippians, and you get this wonderful verse. I thank God for my remembrance of you. Ephesians has a similar benediction. There are these wonderful prayers at the openings of these books of, of Paul just praying blessings uh, on these people that he's writing to. Not so with Galatians. Uh, Paul gets right down to the nitty gritty. It's like, uh, we've got some things to talk about and we need to talk about them now. We'll worry about the, the benedictions and things uh, later. Um, like I said, commenters make a big deal of this. Paul's diving right in from the opening lines into a discussion of what's wrong in the Galatian churches. At times, he uses very harsh language through the book. Uh, it could almost be read as if the Galatians are being talked down to. Um, but I suppose uh, that a better reading or a different reading might be that there's a sense of urgency uh, being created here. Uh, the Galatians are walking away from the gospel. They're, uh, they're forsaking their first love. Uh, we're talking about their eternal destiny being in danger. And Paul is certainly aware of this as he's writing it. Uh, this is not a time to mince words. And so on the surface, it might seem like uh, the issues that crept into the Galatian church were fairly minor, fairly surface level. I mean, uh, it's quite, uh, it's, it might seem like a noble and a pious thing to do to uh, be that much more holy by doing these extra things. Uh, but Paul is here to remind them that you're on very, very dangerous ground if you add to the gospel. Uh, it's uh, a nasty habit that we get into, and the scriptures warn us about it twice in the book of Proverbs. Notice the two references there. It's the same verse uh, both times. Uh, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. Uh, when we consider our faith, uh, very often we want to put our own spin, our own English on it, uh, and sort of bring our own understanding to it. Uh, that's not our place. It's not our job. Our job is to understand uh, the truths of the Bible as God has laid them out and follow them that way. Uh, it might be cool to wear a backwards collar if you're preaching, um, but we're adding to the gospel when we start saying that stuff like that is necessary or required. Uh, and that is one of the grave warnings of this book. And so uh, it calls back to mind uh, the words of Moses as he closes out the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, he lines up the children of Israel into two mountains, has him proclaim blessings and cursings, and he concludes uh, that little session uh, by saying, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I've set before you life and death, a blessing and a curse. So choose life in order that you might live, you and your descendants. So in this uh, comparison of the true gospel and the false gospel, uh, in reality, what you have is uh, a contrast between life and death. Are you going to do things God's way? Or are you going to do things your own way? Uh, if you're going to do things your own way, uh, you're going to have a bad time. So in conclusion, wrapping it up here, we've looked at the forest, looked at the trees, took a quick look at some of the little leaves. And we see that this book uh, uh, has a very unique and special place uh, within the canon of scripture. Um, if you look at church history, it also has a very unique place. Uh, we remember that uh, there's this era called the Reformation, where uh, a lot of uh, our practices and, and thought patterns were influenced at that time. Uh, and it was uh, 
largely kicked off by a feller named Martin Luther, who was uh, a Catholic monk, uh, and he began studying the scriptures, and he began studying Galatians in particular, and this notion that we are justified by faith alone rocked his world. It rocked his world so much that he stood up against uh, the Catholic Church, uh, which at the time had become uh, a bloated mutation of what the church should be. And he said, hey, wait a minute, we're doing all this stuff backwards. We need to just uh, rest and recognize that we are justified by faith alone in Christ alone. Uh, And it was from the book of Galatians that the Holy Spirit moved in that way to bring uh, the church out of darkness and into light. Uh, The cool thing about the Reformation is they have cool Latin titles for all of their things so that you can remember them easily uh, or you can feel really smart when you say them. Uh, And so uh, out of darkness into light uh, is expressed uh, by people who study those kind of things as post tenebras lux, out of darkness light. Uh, (laughs) And it was Galatians. It was the idea that we're justified by faith. Uh, God uh, stowed that thought away in the book of Habakkuk. Paul picks it up in Galatians and uh, expands it for us. Martin Luther picks it up out of Galatians, and the Holy Spirit uses that to change the world. Uh, So uh, the simple idea present in all the scriptures all along was enough to get the ball rolling back in the right direction. Uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians was the perfect answer for the church that he wrote it to. It remained the perfect answer for Martin Luther, and it is still the perfect answer for us today. This little book, not even 2% of the overall volume of the scriptures, is a key tree in the forest of truth. And I pray it edifies you as we study through it. I pray you got some sort of edification out of it today. Um, On a personal note, when I was thinking and praying about uh, what to go through uh, when I'm privileged to, to teach, Uh, I was led to Galatians for a couple of reasons. One, it's uh, one of the earlier books. And so if you're going to read through it canonically or read through it uh, chronologically, it's a a logical place to start. But second, uh, I've dealt in my personal testimony with a lot of times of uh, legalism and Phariseeism. Uh, You know, I've been raised in the church and uh, I've been tempted uh, at several points throughout my life to want to um, puff myself up. In, uh, in legalism. Uh, and I, I, I'm i sure that uh, there are others uh, who've dealt with that as well. And this book is uh, a wonderful salve uh, for that particular burn, I think, uh, and something that's very important to meditate on, um, that God's work uh, in our lives, God's word in the scriptures is enough. And uh, it should point us always back to Christ. And so Uh, I'd like to leave you today with uh, one of my favorite benedictions, Jude 24. Now to him who's able to keep you from stumbling, to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. The only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. To God be the glory. Uh, As we study, as we go about our lives, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this book. Uh, We pray that uh, our time today has been fruitful and a blessing to you. We pray that our worship is a sweet savor to you. We ask that you bless us going forward and uh, show us the way to walk and give us the strength and the power to walk in it. We ask these things in your name. Amen.